Okay. Is everybody ready? Then I shall begin. So today we're going to talk about what are the essential principles of, of the Alexander Technique, in my opinion. And I need to stress, in my opinion, because as I said on the first day that we talked together, I don't have a monopoly of truth. I'm just one person exploring my own Alexander journey and coming up with my own conclusions after reading the books in my own way, with my own limitations. It's unfortunate that historically there have been so many wars in the Alexander world. Wars between this teacher and that teacher from the first training course or courses. And I don't think it was really about right and wrong. There's room in the Alexander umbrella for, for all of us. And I hope that um, our generation doesn't have to repeat some of those rights and wrongs of the earlier generations. I tend to think that the, some of the rivalries of the early generations, those that started off the early training courses, were much more about differences of personality, stylistic differences, and also maybe sibling rivalry. Who does Daddy Alexander love most? Who is he passing on his inheritance to? Who does he favor? Rather than this teacher has the essence of the Alexander technique and the rest don't. The pure legacy of the Alexander technique, whatever pure means, we, we don't really know what is the pure legacy. And we can fight about it, but maybe it's important for each one of us when we go through our Alexander journey to embody what is true for us and not turn Alexander into a dogma and into a straitjacket, but to keep it something alive and vital that nourishes the mind, body and spirit. So when I talk about the essentials, the essential principles of Alexander, I'm talking really just about my own understanding. And I'm, of course, inspired by many teachers that have gone before me. And I certainly hope I don't upset anybody with my, my thoughts. I'm sure some people may be upset when we don't all agree. But I can say this as a, as a Jewish person, I can say that, as the saying goes, for every two Jews, there's three opinions. And maybe it's the same for Alexander teachers. For every two Alexander teachers, there's, there's three opinions. And that's okay. That's all right. We can hold that space. We're a big umbrella. And hopefully a kind and compassionate umbrella too. So what's essential? Maybe we also need to think about what isn't essential. And yesterday we were talking about Body shape isn't essential, that I can be like this. And maybe we'll start with the difference between mechanical advantage and use of self. Alexander, first of all, started thinking about mechanical advantage. It was rather important to him. He saw things early on much more physically than later on. So mechanical advantage. The early monkey position was considered to be one of the positions of mechanical advantage. The students were the ones that called it the monkey position. But mechanical advantage isn't essential. It's more of an, an advantage to be in a monkey position if you're doing things lower in space. But it's not essential. You can pick up something from the floor like this if you want to. There's no such thing as a wrong shape. We have our bodies and they can do anything that we want to. They can stretch and pull and push. Look at acrobats and performers and dancers and street theatres. We can do anything with our bodies and it may not be an advantage. I wouldn't want to go around like this all day. It wouldn't be a great advantage. But Alexander developed something very different 
when he talked about good use. And I think it's important not to confuse good use with good shape or good aesthetics or the perfect body. I think that would be very unfortunate. I was very privileged to have worked with Patrick McDonald for a number of years, and he had a condition of ankylosing spondylitis. Very, very, especially towards the end of his life, the condition became more prevalent. It became more visible, and he was quite bowed down around his head and neck. And it was very difficult to work with him, to work on him. And it would be a, a great mistake to confuse this individual form with good use. In fact, any of us that, had, that worked with McDonald and had the wonderful, wonderful benefit of his hands on us could never confuse the shape of this older man with good or not good use. We knew that his hands were marvelous exquisite, magical. But from the outside you say, but look at his posture. Posture isn't essential. Posture is not essential. It may be inherited, it may be post-accident, it may be a disease state, maybe birth defects, many things. Posture is not important. We mustn't get overly swung by posture, by shape by individual differences. But use of self is so much more interesting than mechanics and aesthetics. And the later Alexander, and it's important to see Alexander is constantly evolving. Any of you that have watched, seen Erica Whittaker talk about Alexander will tell you how he was constantly changing his mind constantly evolving, constantly changing his hypotheses about what it was that he was doing. We can't hold on to one idea and say that's Alexander, constantly evolving. But the later Alexander saw use of the self as about how we react to life, to stimuli from without and from within, not do you have a straight back or a lengthened spine, a lengthened back, a lengthened torso, a free neck? That really wasn't his main interest later on. Of course, it's nicer to have a free neck and a lengthened and widened torso. Of course it is. But that really wasn't his main purpose. There's a very lovely story about Alexander who was asked, well, what is it that you're doing? His students asked him and he said, well, look, come over here. And he said, hold on to my wrists. Just feel, feel my wrists, feel my pulse. And he shouted. He lost his temper. He was an actor. He lost his temper and he started screaming at someone in the room. He said, now check, check my pulse. And the person that was holding his wrist said, well, it's absolutely normal. He said, that's what I'm doing. I'm not reacting. I'm shouting, I'm doing all sorts of things. But he was trying to get across the idea that when his nervous system was in a state of okay, not flight fight, not adrenaline, not reactive, that's the state that he was interested in. That's the state he was interested in, not whether he had a particular shape or a particular aesthetic, or his shoulders were doing something that looks nice. He was interested in reactions to stimuli from without and from within. And so then you may ask, well, what's the right way to teach? So we go back to Alexander's books, or we go back to the first generation of Alexander teachers and we say, well, what is the real way, the true way, the core of the Alexander teaching? And maybe I can share with you one or two of my experiences with some of these first generation people. 
I can start off with Alexander, who I never met. I'm not that old. And he started his formulations, his direction formulations with, and I'm sure you know it, relax the neck and put the head forwards and upwards. Put the head, relax the neck and put the head. He evolved and changed that later on to let the neck be free, to let the head go forwards and up. Notice the importance of the word let, the lovely little word allow, let. There's something evolving here, let, allow, and how these sentences were all connected with the, the little word to, let the neck be free to, let the head go forward and up to, which means in order to, one thing does the other, one thing does the other. You don't do it. And then as I quoted to you later on, we have the Alexander in 1946 who said to Carrington that he'd finally decided to cut out in future teaching all instructions to order the neck to relax or to be free because such orders only lead to other forms of doing. That was Alexander, 1946, after he'd written all his books so he couldn't write it down anywhere. But it was there. And someone said to Carrington, one of his students said to Carrington, well, look, he's telling you, cut out directions, cut out this way of talking and ordering pupils. Why aren't you following this? And Carrington replied, well, young man, old habits do die hard. <laughs> so that's, that's Alexander. And then we move on to Walter Carrington, lovely man. And he put hands on, put hands on me and he'd say, well, just have a little wish for your neck to be free. And then he'd stop, he wouldn't go on talking about directions. He'd just then spend a good few minutes with me saying things like, there you go, that's good, there you go, there you go, that's good, there you go. That was his patter. And then we move on to Marjorie Barstow in America, in Nebraska. Marjorie, Marjorie Barstow would say something like, just a little, little bit of ease of the head moving slightly in an upward direction. And then you allowing the body to follow with the same ease, a little delicate poise, a little delicate head moving slightly upwards, and her hands were magical. I got the story. And then there was MacDonald. He'd say, stay back, aim up. Stay back, aim up. This very dynamic man. Stay back, aim up. And up we'd charge. With an, what he called an up thrust in the spine. You have to experience it to realise the, the, the immense power in his hands and in all the other teachers' hands. And Marjorie Barlow, very classical niece of Alexander, she'd say, you say no, refuse to give consent, and let the neck be free to let the head go forwards and up. Her husband, on the other hand, said to me in the 80s, he said, look, I don't really like those directions. I've changed them. He was a, a rheumatologist and he said, You've got to say it like this, neck free, neck long, neck forward, neck, no, neck free, neck long, head forwards, head up. So that's the only way to do it. He said, if you miss out neck long, you're missing a trick. And that was his, that was his version. And then there's Miss Goldie, who I went to for many years for lessons. And she, her favorite one, for me, she may have said different things to different people. She'd say to me, remain quiet throughout but more alert than ever before. Remain quiet throughout, but more alert than ever before. All of them, totally different. Who's right? Who's wrong? It's the wrong question. It's the wrong question. 
the only question we need to ask is what was the use of self of, of the person that was saying them not the formulation of the words which is the right way of talking it's the wrong question which is the right sequence it's the wrong question which language should you give directions in that's easy when i was trained in jerusalem the only language that you should teach alexander in is the holy language of hebrew that's obvious that's the way i was taught I thought that was the that was the way that was my teacher shmuel a wonderful man so it doesn't really make sense to ask the language the exact words what matters which is essential to all Alexander teaching is the use of the self of the person that's saying them. The communication between teacher and pupil while you're saying words or no words. There can be sound in silence. Can you hear it? There can be sound in silence, not just because I like Simon and Garfunkel. The sound of silence. So words and no words are variables. They're not essential. Should you give directions? What does it mean to give directions or to give orders or to instruct yourself? Do I believe in giving directions? Very much so. But what do I mean? That's a, a larger question, a much larger question. You know, it's really strange in our Alexander world for, for many of us, it's, it doesn't really matter. We, we, we're considered to be okay if we say we give directions. And it doesn't really matter how we give them or what we do while we're giving them. Maybe we can grab someone and smack them over the head as long as we're saying neck free, head forward and up. <laughs> but it's not what's important. It's really not what's important. What's important is the quality of your attention, your being, your way of being kind to yourself while you're working your attitude towards self and other while you're working. That's what communicates across the divide. It's not what you say, but the condition that you're in while you're saying it, that is the real message of an Alexander teacher. And we miss the plot when we get into wars about what the essential Alexander teacher really has to do, inhibit and direct. You know, we have a real problem in our world and we, we'll, we'll end up with more wars unless we are a bit more compassionate with ourselves and others about what we do. And so we ask ourselves, what do we mean? And it's complicated because I can say to my pupils, I want you to direct, direct your neck to be free. Do I know what they'll do with that request? Well, of course I don't. Some will imagine the, the words. Some will do them. Some will try and feel them out. I'm reminded very strongly by what Marjorie Barla used to say to us in the Alexander Institute in the 80s. She'd say, look, you all think you're just thinking. You're not. You're feeling. And you all think you're feeling, but actually you're not. You're doing. And she said, it's really important to understand the difference between them. And as we may have read in Alexander's books, he said, don't use imagination as a vehicle for, di for direction because it utilizes faulty sensory appreciation. So where do we go? Well, we're not supposed to imagine the words. We're not supposed to do the words. We're not supposed to feel them out inside ourselves. What do we do? No one ever told me what it meant to direct. And so I had to try to work this all out for myself. And I'm sure many of you have to work it out as well. And so for me, being directed or being home, back home, 
is much more important than the words or the absence of words I may use to come back home. But being back home, within myself, embodied, alive, vital, in touch, resonant, and in relationship, is more important than formulaic words that might get me there or not get me there. They might get me into a pickle, or they may liberate. I'm okay with either. It's okay whatever you choose. So the essential principles of Alexander. Being directed is essential. Being in a good state of use is essential, but not essential for every second of every lesson. We also have to be kind enough to ourselves to know that even when we're working, and we're working well, that there'll be moments when we mind wander, and we'll come back home a little bit quicker, hopefully, than usual, when we'll concentrate, try and fix something, and we'll come back again. When we'll end gain and try and convince something, somebody of what we're trying to say. Or we might get a bit despondent, or when someone's feeling distressed or sad, we might start to pull down and hopefully come back again. That there's nothing constant and permanent. Constant, the real meaning of constant is that we have it as a state that is strong enough to return to rather than intermittent, universal constant. So we can be kind enough to ourselves to know that we don't have to be perfect to deliver a good lesson. Maybe if you're at home with yourself, in communion with yourself, in a good condition, your state of use is okay just for maybe a few minutes of each lesson at a high level of accuracy then that may be okay. My teacher, Shmuel Nelkin in Jerusalem, always used to emphasize what he called in Hebrew, diuk, which means precision. Precision, he really wanted us to be very precise, not waffly and wishy-washy and relax. Always coming back to a clarity. But not to maybe keep it all the time. To hold on to this thing is going to make you lose it even more quickly. So, the essential principles of Alexander would be use of self. And let's move on to some other principles that maybe we can all share. The importance of inhibition and non-doing. Uh, if I can quote to you MacDonald, a very inspiring teacher of mine, as you know, He'd say, well, of course, non-doing is a kind of doing, but it's very subtle. The difference is that in doing, you do it. Whereas in non-doing, it does you. How, how beautiful that is. For actually, we are not the ones that do the change. However ambitious and end-gaining we might be, MacDonald says something profoundly important. Actually, the doing happens from itself, not from the intellect or the ambition or the trying of the teacher. The doing does itself. It does you. Something organic inside of you does you. And it doesn't need our little help to sort of help it on its way with a little freeing up of the neck, in my understanding. But in a way, we want to get out of that way. We want to get out of our own way to let it happen. The more we fiddle about with trying to make the thing work, with trying to improve the primary control, the less it has a chance of emerging from the depths of organic wisdom. So yes, inhibition, yes, doing. But do I believe in stopping the inhibition of stopping before things happen in everyday life? No, I don't. I don't want to put a pause before every action and then start sending messages to myself. Life is too rich, 
to want to make a pause. But do I make pauses in my lessons? Yes, because that's a clinical moment. I'll be about to get a pupil out of the chair. I'll say stop, stay back. Encourage non-preparation, non-anticipation. It's called the means whereby technique. That's essential not to go straight for the end, but to build up capacities within the self, the psychophysical self. What else is essential? Maybe just to emphasize that the primary control is not the same as the neck, head and back relationship. The primary control is the self-writing mechanism something deep inside the organism that we can see as akin to homeostasis that self-corrects like when you cut yourself the wound heals and when we stop interfering we spontaneously recover that's the wisdom of medicine we take out the impediments so the primary control is this capacity that we all have as living organisms to recover and to return to balance. The neck, head and back relationship is a barometer of whether we react or don't react to stimuli. It's evidence. So if there's a loud bang and I go, <gasps> then you can see my body language, my neck, head and back as evidence that I've reacted. And then hopefully I'll recover. And you'll see oh, Anthony's neck, head and back relationship is evidence that Anthony's recovering. His primary control is kicking in. But they're not the same thing, if you understand what I'm trying to say. Because if they were the same thing, then this would mean that I'm reacting and I'm not. I'm just playing with my shape. Another Alexander principle, faulty sensory appreciation. Yes, we don't want to trust feelings, but what sort of feelings? This can be used as a, a stick, an unhealthy stick to beat ourselves and beat our pupils up with if we're not careful. It doesn't mean don't trust your feelings. If you've got a stomachache, you've got a stomachache. If you're feeling sad, you're feeling sad. Faulty sensory appreciation is more concerned with where you are in space. Do I feel crooked when I'm not crooked? Do I feel one shoulder's up around my ears when I'm not? If I've been like this for a long time and I start to emerge, I may feel goodness. I feel like I'm doing this because of the contrast feeling. That's faulty sensory appreciation. It does not mean don't trust your emotional experience. Don't trust your embodied experience. That would be very, very unwise and very disembodying. Another principle psychophysical unity that is it's impossible to separate mind and body how do we know that well body language tells us that down in the dumps stiff necked is weak at the knees spineless bearing the world world on your shoulders of course the mind and body are connected they always are and always will be. There is an essential unity of mind and body. Use affects function, something Dr. Barlow talked a lot about. If we're in a state of hyperreactivity, we don't function very well. What's function? We don't think so well. We don't move so well. Our digestion doesn't work so well. We don't see so well. We don't talk so well. That's function. Use, use of self is not use of body, it's how we react to stimuli. Let's add on a few more essentials. It's always the teacher's responsibility and never the pupil's. Always take it on the chin if it doesn't quite work out okay. That's something Shmuel used to teach us all the time. Never blame your pupil. Never blame your pupil. 
I don't know if any of you know Erika Ritika or met her, but uh, she would often talk about her experiences of Alexander and her aunt, Ethel Webb, who was one of Alexander's earliest uh, pupils, teachers. And she'd say that Alexander was a horrifically difficult man in early 1900s. He'd lose his temper all the time. And that in the later 30s, when she met him, he was a delightful, kind man. But in the beginning, he used to beat people around them, not, not physically, he used to get furious with people when they wouldn't get it. And Erica's aunt, Ethel Webb, her way of giving directions was, keep your lengthening, my dear. And Erica said that the most important word was my dear, not keep your lengthening. That Alexander, she said, Alexander became kinder and kinder. She said, early Alexander, he didn't always get what he wanted. But as he became kinder, he got better results. And one day he came into the teaching room and said, excitedly, I can now get it despite them. That actually there was something within his being that got the results he wanted. That was a big change. Maybe we can also be kinder to ourselves rather than, than overly ambitious at wanting our pupils to get it right. That actually we have to give them a new experience. What else do I think is essential? There's no such thing as a wrong shape. We talked about that. Alexander guidance, whether it's hands-on or anything else, is an invitation. It's not a demand. It's not a demand. And of course, we all know the other Alexander principle, if only you stop doing the wrong, the right will do itself. That you don't need to know much about the right. I mean, it's lovely to know about the right. It's wonderful to know how the organism functions anatomically, physiologically. It's quite exquisitely beautiful. And Ted Diamond is inspirational when he's talking about the anatomy of the primary control. But do you need to know it? in order to live it? No. Little children don't know it, but they live it. But maybe it's a time to dispel a myth about children being perfect. Children are not perfect. <laughs> Why do I say that? Because I've got two of them, <laughs> an eight-year-old and a nine-year-old. And they are not all things good use. When they're undisturbed and happy, and I give them their iPads, they're all very, very happy <laughs> and poised. The second I take their iPads away, after half an hour or longer, they'll have a temper tantrum. And the next will tighten and they'll go all like this. There's very little inhibition in children. And sometimes as adults, we haven't got very much of it either. But the idea that children are perfect, no, but children, when they're when they're young, uh, unspoiled, they can move with beauty and grace. But that doesn't mean that they've got all the ingredients of essential Alexander, which is to develop capacities for non-reaction. To develop capacities for non-reaction. So it's not like we come, become like children, because we actually have to go a stage way beyond children, where we have the capacity for our lollipops to be taken away and still be okay. To have our lollipops taken away and still be okay. That's not like children. That's an evolution. That's a development of the self. What else is essential? Organic time, not ambition time. Things will change or not change within ourselves and our pupils when it's ready. Not when I'm ready, here, but when it's ready, somewhere deep inside. You can't rush organic time. When the seeds create the flower, it'll sprout. But you can't pull it up and make it quicker. Same with ourselves. Another Alexander principle, 
moving from the known to the unknown. The importance of not knowing too much, not knowing too much about right and wrong. There's a lovely Alexander quote, he said, you all want to know when you're right. You never will. And even if you did know, you'll wish you didn't. All you ever need to know in this world is when you're wrong and learn to prevent it. It's quite a nice quote. We don't do the change. Teachers don't do the change. We create conditions where change takes place. We create the ground. We facilitate a space where change can take place when necessary, when it wants to. And if it doesn't want to, that is just as okay. I often say to my pupils who are in pain or discomfort, you don't need to get rid of it. We hold that space together. In too much of a rush to get rid of it and correct it actually doesn't do anybody any favours. Staying the same is a, a wonderful route to allowing change when it's, when it's ready, when it's necessary. What else is essential? Yes, not to excite the fear reflexes. Because Alexander wrote very clearly, when you excite the fear reflexes, no learning can take place. No learning can take place. He didn't mean learning about necks and backs and anatomy and physiology, but no learning that we were talking about in the first session. Emotional learning, real learning, learning about who we are as human beings. When you excite the fear reflexes, no growth, no development and no evolution can take place. If your pupil feels they've got to please you, not disappoint you, they've got to succeed. And it can be very subtle. And with all the goodwill in the world, we can evoke fear reflexes in our pupils. And it can be as simple as saying, that's really good. And some people, depending on their personality type, will feel goodness. It was really good that time, but oh my gosh, what if I can't remain really good? And that presses the fear re reflex button. For some other types, if you don't encourage, they'll think, goodness, I'm not good enough. I'm doing something wrong. For some, if you work in silence, they'll feel abandoned, frightened, alone, neglected. You don't know. You have to get to know the individual pupil in front of you to work effectively and adapt. Alexander called that the variations of the teacher's art. The variations of the teacher's art. You can't do the same thing, say the same thing, work in the same way with every pupil. Some pupils will come in with habitual patterns very different to another. And as we saw from the four quadrants yesterday, some will be more habitually concentrating, some more N-gainy types, some more collapsed, some wandering off into the ether. You'll work with them differently. You'll adapt the variations of the teacher's art. And then you've got different stylistic variations as well. I sometimes use humour. It falls flat so often, but I still use it. It's just who I am. I try and break, <laughs> I try and break the, uh, the initial tense moments when I meet somebody. It sometimes works, sometimes doesn't. I have my way, I have my patter, but no one can copy what I do. I can't copy what MacDonald did or Miss Goldie did. I can only be Anthony. I can only be myself. I can try and be a pale imitation of someone who I immensely admire, but that'll come across as very ungenuine. It may be an initial thing when I'm trying out things to copy someone for a while, but essentially, the more you can be who you are, and honor your, your own individual style, the better you can be, whether it's different to your trainer or teachers, I think it most likely will be. And I think we need to honor that. 
we don't need to be all clones of some mythical Alexander who we've never met or mythical clones of a teacher who we trained with. I don't want any more Anthony's around from my training course. One is quite enough. And so it's really important that we value, we value difference. That there are certain essentials that I'm not so keen to compromise on. So those are the main principles that I hold very, very dear and I see as essential. And there are stylistic differences that we've talked about that I see as less essential. And I would adapt that into an individual lesson with differences of mechanics, different heights of chair, different feet apart or feet together, different procedures, hands on the back of a chair, a whispered R's, many different things at different times and different moments. And now I want to spend just a few moments on maybe another elephant in the room, which is, can Alexander be taught online? Can Alexander be taught online? Now, some of you may have made up your mind. Maybe a simple, of course it can. Maybe for others it's, well, that goes against the essence of the Alexander technique. Both are very legitimate. So I have to come clean. Uh, we moved our training school online this term. Totally. All the students are being trained online this term and not simply for theoretical input. And I'm also giving lessons online. Now, the reason why I'm giving lessons online and training online isn't that I've somehow reneged on what I believe is essential about, about Alexander. Quite the opposite. I still don't want to teach shape, positions, mechanical advantage, anatomical accuracy, whether it's in a room with somebody or on Zoom. However, however, I do believe and experienced that I can reach another human being, touch another human being without hands. And there are other vehicles for touch, not just hands. There's voice, which carries a huge amount of information. You can be uplifted by kindness, not kind words. Words are cheap, cheap, but you can be uplifted by compassion, by empathy. You can be uplifted by being in the presence of someone who can bear your struggle and not go down with you. That's the difference between empathy and sympathy. It's an essential principle. Empathy is your open, your heart can break with another human being, but you're not going down into the depths with them. You're holding your space and holding them at the same time. You're empathic. In sympathy, you join them where they are. You're not much value, like give them a cup of tea. But there's a big difference. Alexander teachers are empathic, ideally, and not sympathetic, going in the same direction as the pupil. So do I feel I can reach and touch another human being through Zoom? Yes. Do I miss hands desperately? It's an extra element, but I don't believe hands are primary. I believe use of self is primary. Use of self includes my voice, my gestures, my movements, my facial expressions, and maybe something else that we can't really put our finger on, that we might call essence or being. Can that influence another person's 
use of self? Of course it can. We all know that. If you walk into a room where there's been an argument, you can feel prickly. When you're really low walking down the street and you suddenly see someone you haven't seen for a while who you care about, you go, oh, how amazing to see you here. What's lifted you? What has lifted your spirits and your body? Goodness gracious, without hands? Yes. You can be uplifted through the experience of being. You can be uplifted by a beautiful view. You can be uplifted by music, by dance, by opera. You can be uplifted by a thought, your own thoughts. You can be pulled down by equally thoughts. The beauty of hands, the beauty of hands, which is why I miss them so much, is the constancy. I can keep my hands on for a huge part of a lesson. I don't. I like to take them off and put them on. Shmuel used to tell us to renew, to renew all the time. Not get stuck in one position, to renew ourselves. The beauty of hands is in the constancy. If I want to communicate my own being, I'm going to have to talk rather a lot. Or someone's going to have to see my gestures, so I am somehow influencing. But without the tactile sense, I have to refine and amplify and be more creative with my other senses. And that's really, it's a challenge, but it's not against the essential principles of the Alexander Technique. And maybe that's where I'll stop. I, I hold out the possibility of influencing through voice, through being, through gesture, through face, one human being meeting another human being, and influence use to use. As long as it's use to use, I am okay, and I'll still see that as essentially Alexander. The same way as I see essential Alexander in the touch, is not about correcting postures and positions, but also use affecting use in two directions. If we have another time for a session, maybe in a week or two, I am happy to share some Alexander remote Zoom uh, work. Uh, if there's interest in that, maybe I'll offer that as well, but maybe you can write to me whether you want me to do a session on how, how to work online, use to use, use of self to use of self. But I do hope we end lockdown soon for all our sakes I'm missing my I'm missing my touch so there is a little time for questions yes uh, I'm just reading that the chat is saying yes please yes yes please yes please so I assume that everybody wants to see you um, or um, learn about your approach to teaching teach you online yes well I'd be very happy to do it very happy. Uh, the question is trying to find a good time. The reason I chose this week is because I know that everyone was very fascinated with Ted Diamond's uh, uh, work. So I didn't want to crash on his, um, his parade. And so if there's a space up in the online calendar, I'll try and find uh, a good time to, to share with you what my thoughts and way of working is and see if it resonates with, with you guys and, and we'll, we'll see where we go with it. Um, it's something I'm doing. I love the opportunity of working with people from Japan, Dubai, America, South Africa, uh, in my private one-to-one -one online work. So I haven't been able to do that so easily from my Alexander studio in central London, where they have to fly all the way to see me. So, okay, anyway, questions? Um. I would suggest that we ask Pat Brown, who had to leave before she had a chance to ask yesterday. Would you like to um, 
I can do. Uh, it was a question about yesterday's talk, though. So I don't know if I can quite remember what was. <laughs> I think it was. It was to do with. Um, you were talking. Oh goodness! You were talking about words and language, and and um, I think you were talking about affirming pupils so that they always felt safe and yeah, you know, not critical. So, and I was thinking. Um, and I think you also said um, something like words don't matter. <laughs> but I think sometimes they can if they, so for example, if a pupil says, oh, it feels better if I concentrate, for example, or, oh, at the end of the lesson, I feel really relaxed. And I don't want to turn around and say, don't concentrate, because I, I don't think they are in the sense that we might think of it being bad. But it's just, it's just, it's just that whole thing of their experience and it's, sometimes it's so hard to, well, you can't really know. I think, I think you've hit, hit the nail on the head and I would totally go along with that. If someone says at the end of a session, I feel so relaxed and just much more able to concentrate on what's before me, I'd say, great. I wouldn't say that you mustn't concentrate because okay. I don't know what they mean by concentration. <laughs> so I say, I affirm it. Why <laughs> would you do anything else? To start having arguments about terminology with a pupil at the end of a lesson is it's bonkers. So yeah. give them a break. Yeah, <laughs> Otherwise, they're not going to come back next week. <laughs> <laughs> next one. Yes. Another hand. Very common. Yes. I'm, I'm mute here. Yes. Um, well, the first thing to say is that I'm really impressed by your um, uh, daring to share such a personal um, experience um, and talk about yourself, particularly in the, in the, in the community of Alexander teachers. Um, and I, I'm surprised to see that the spectrum of approaches to the Alexander technique is so, so wide. Um, uh, now, the other thing I, I say here, you're talking, which is um, very refreshing, uh, because you seem to embrace the idea of um, how important is the emotional state of the, of the pupil. Um, it hasn't been my experience at all. I mean, I had very good teachers, but I also experienced a lot of um, uh, uh, somehow stress response and fear response um, by um, sensing that I was criticized, judged, mm. or being not accepted wherever I was. So what I wanted to ask you is um, the terminology you're using, and I know you are a psychotherapist, I study psychology too. Um, it really reminds me of the work of Marion Rosen, who developed the Rosen Method bodywork. And Alan Fogel, who is a professor um, of psychology and a Rosen Method um, practitioner, he talks about embodied self-awareness and he talks about interoception as a sense of ourselves, a sense of our, how we feel. Um, so I wonder if your work, or the work, sorry, the way you are approaching the the teaching of the technique and the way you see it, whether it has been influenced by the Rosen method at all? Mm. The quick answer to that is no, but having explored so many things since the age of 13 years old, I don't know if you can see all these books here. There's a thousand books. I haven't read every single page, but there's everything there from um, Eastern mysticism to Aldous Huxley to uh, uh, Rolfing, uh, psychotherapy, Stanley Kellerman. There's so much stuff there. Uh, Peter Levine, uh, there's, there's so many, Gary Zukav, so many things, somatic illnesses. I don't know what's influenced me, what hasn't, but I do believe that what I'm doing is the Alexander technique. I don't give Alexander technique and then start becoming psychotherapist. No, I believe I'm a psychophysical Alexander teacher that embraces what Alexander called the psychological, 
the physical and the spiritual, the, the whole spectrum of being human. I don't think it's, it's out of the Alexander remit to honor a person's lived experience any more than it's wrong to acknowledge a pain in the neck. Why is a pain in the neck any more or less important? If we honor psychophysical unity, I just don't think it's a question. But I don't pretend to be a physiotherapist and I don't act in an Alexander lesson as a psychotherapist. This is something I'm sharing with everybody that I believe we can all hold psychophysical unity. And if a person cries or feels upset when they release or open up from something, that's just as interesting as if a pain goes away. I don't want to prioritize one over another. So in terms of what's influenced me, I've no idea. As I said the other day, life has influenced me. Having children's influenced me. There's many teachers that have influenced me over the years outside of formal Alexander work. I hope that answers the question a little bit. Yeah. yeah. So Rose and I think I did come across 20 years ago. I think it was a hands-on, very gentle hands-on work. But I um, can't remember too much about it, to be honest. Yeah. I'll check it up. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. Anybody else? There's some more hands up. There's Olivia Duke. Yes. Can you unmute yourself? Thank you. Yes, I have. Hi. Um, can you hear me? Yes, very well. Um, hi. Um, thank you for the talks, by the way. I've really enjoyed it. Um, I just was thinking when you're talking about faulty sensory appreciation, and you said that's very much just about sort of proprioception, where you are in space and, and that stuff. And not that we would be teaching this as an Alexander teacher, but I just, for myself, I've wondered if that does also include emotions in some way, not that I don't know if I'm happy or sad, and but um, that sometimes we sort of misunderstand things or project, we sort of might have an emotional reaction, which actually turns out to be um, wrong, because it might have just been we misread something or misread a person, and then we got very angry and upset, or we're projecting something from somewhere else, and I wonder actually if that is all tied into our faulty sensory perceptions. Well, I... I believe very strongly that when the psychophysical organism is disturbed, we will have all sorts of feelings that may not be accurate. That is true, but it's not for me to point them out. That's an exploration in psychotherapy. So yes, paranoia is a very good example. Um, when you feel people are getting at you and they're not, for instance, or you feel someone said something unkind with an unkind intent and actually it was meant kindly. So people can have the wrong idea about people. Another example is anorexia, which is a, a form of psychosis where you actually don't actually believe what you see in the mirror about form. So yes, um, when the psychophysical organism is disturbed, there are many things that can go wrong in terms of mental functioning and, and, and clarity. Um, but in an Alexander setting, I won't go into whether a person's feelings about this, that or the other are accurate or not. If a person says they're feeling sad, I won't say, well, actually, you're probably feeling angry. Yeah. That may be true, but that's now moving into psychotherapy. And I don't do that yeah. in an Alexander session. Yeah, no, that, yeah, I wouldn't think that would be something you would yeah. But you are totally right, 100% yeah. right, that um, it isn't just our perceptions of where we are in space that can go wrong, so to speak, or be inaccurate. We can have many thoughts and fantasies that can be an example of inaccurate um, ide ideation. Very much so. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Anybody else? Valentin kann nicht. Yes. Can you unmute yourself? Uh... Yeah. Thank you, Anthony, for the talk. Also, the way you talked, you gave time to receive information. And I just had one question about the four quadrants. If you could just mention them again without going into it, it would be nice for me. Yes. So the four 
quadrants. These are the way of conceptualizing Alexander's, what he called habits of thinking, uh, rather than habits of body, which he didn't really talk about, habits of thinking. That we have, we don't have a habit of the neck tightening, although the neck may tighten. The habit is, is much more interesting when we look at what makes the neck tighten and prevent that. So if the neck tightens through end gaining, when I'm trying to convince you, Valentin, of something I'm trying to say, my neck, and I'm always trying to convince people, I'm going around convincing the world that Anthony's good and right, that I'm going to get my tight neck. But the neck isn't so important. Yes, it gives me the pain. But what Alexander was getting at was not that you just have to change the neck and have a nice massage or even elongate the neck, but to prevent the repetition of the habit of end gaining. That will solve my neck, not just for now, but for all times. And the neck pain may, may not have to recur day in, day out. So that's end gaining, the habit, that's a quadrant. And there's other ones. There's concentration, I'm always doing this. That's why I've got lines here, I'm always concentrating. But the answer isn't to sort of have plastic surgery or stick some Botox here as nice as it might be, but to prevent the habit of concentration, even if it gives me a headache. The headache isn't the problem. The concentration is the problem. And the collapse relax, which gives me a pain in my lower back and starts to push my discs, squash them and cause them to slip, herniate. That's not the problem, although it's the problem I come with. The problem is, what's my habit of depressing myself and collapsing myself? That's the Alexander habits that were, for Alexander, things that we should be tackling on the thought level and not on a postural physical level. And the final one is the mind wandering. The pupil that can't pay attention because being here at home is so painful. So boring, maybe the teacher's uninspiring. They just have to wander, but that's not so habitual. Hopefully the rest of life can be interesting, but the habit of mind wandering, the habit of mind wandering is where being at home is not so easy that we have to wander somewhere a bit safer. So those are the four quadrants and we flip traditionally from one extreme to another without actually going to the center. And the work of an Alexander teacher is to take us into the center through prevention, which is why Alexander called his work the art of prevention, the work of prevention rather than correction. We're preventing the habits of thought, not correcting them because they're wrong. None of them are wrong. Only when we're safe enough can we come off the quadrants and move a little bit closer to the center of home where we belong. Thanks, Valentin. Thanks for the question. I love dialogue. I, I think I act much better with dialogue and questions. I don't like speaking up into the air. It's like singing in the bath. There's no one to, no one there. <laughs> I like the idea of talking to people where they ask me questions. It brings things out of me in a much more organic way than talking to a screen. I, you have lovely faces, but I like the idea of seeing it's in your expressions and that helps me make a little bit more sense than I might otherwise. So thank you for your invitations to me to, to share my thoughts. It brings them out. Do you have time for two more? I have time for two more. Okay. But feel free to leave and get your cups of coffee and tea and whatever. I won't, I'm not offended. <laughs> So Jennifer Borki is yeah. yes. Hi, Anthony. Hello. Can you hear me okay? I can hear you well. Okay. Well, first of all, I would just like to thank you for your wonderful talks. They've been very inspiring and I'm really grateful for um, the honesty that, uh, that you demonstrate. And in talking about so many uh, acknowledging so many things that I think make us feel uncomfortable uh, to acknowledge our frailty and our uh, 
um, uh, insecurities as teachers, as pupils. Um, so I have a question that I think you might be the only person in the Alexander community I could ask this of, um, but that is kind of an elephant in the room. What does an Alexander teacher do when confronted with a student and you just feel, I don't like this person. I'm sure it happens. I'm sure it happens to everyone, but what yeah. do you do? Yes. Well, when you're at a party and you introduce to someone who you don't like very much, it's reasonably easy. You might be stuck with them for a few minutes, but then you make your excuses and say, I need a drink and off you go. Yeah. But, uh, <laughs> when they walk into your room and there's something you don't like, it's an immense challenge. The question isn't whether you like them or don't like them. If you don't like them, that's your experience right there and then. It depends on your reaction to the not liking. If it's literally making you bristle with irritation because they remind you of your irritating mum or irritating dad or irritating brother or sister, this is really pressing on all your buttons with your ex-husband, ex-wife, whatever, then it may just be too much of a stimulus for you to handle and still be at home and okay when you're working. And you may just have to say, I'm not sure I'm the right person for you. And, or you might do a white lie and suggest that you're a little bit too busy at that particular time or whatever, or you've got someone who you think is more suitable to them than you are. And that's okay. If you can manage that hot seat, if you can manage the experience of sitting with your own discomfort, and that's, that's the issue, it's your stimulus. It's your being irritated, you're finding it unpleasant. If you are, and you can hold that space, you may discover that you will find something that is rather endearing after a while. That was initially very irritating, and after a while you think, you know what, they keep on asking me these bloody difficult questions and challenging my credentials and asking me how long I've been training and asking me this and that. And after a while you think, you know what? They're so frightened that they're not gonna be looked after by you. I really care for that side of you. I understand. And you know what? They may become your best pupils. <laughs> so it, I would say if you can, hold the spot, hold the space hold your own irritations and allow them to, to work through you, if you can. It could be, there could be a great gift in there somewhere. Okay, so good luck. Thank you. We all have it, by the way. I certainly have it. And sometimes I fail miserably. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay. Thank you. Okay. There was one more. Yeah, that could be me. Ah, hi. Hi. I just, uh, uh, this has been really good. I feel like I've been spending time with you. And it's been me. I feel like I've learned a lot. And I, but I'm also thinking that Erica Whitaker, I think I have this right. I never knew that person, but apparently spending time with Erica was was the way that things tended to work if you went for a lesson with her. Perhaps she didn't use her hands necessarily, but you might just spend time and that was constructive. So that kind of leads, leads on in a way to back to the elephant in the room of, of online teaching. Um, and also perhaps group teaching where, you know, hands directly aren't necessarily used but I've seen in all these situations that that can be really effective and, and should people can change in groups or online or just by sitting. But just to take it on, I'm, I'm wondering, some people claim that online work can actually be more effective, more effective than direct working with people with hands. And I'm just wondering if, you, with your recent experience, 
you're having any thoughts about that? Well, I'll say this. If online work is more effective, then the only element that would make it more effective would be the absence of touch. So if people believe that online work is more effective, then sit in the same real room with them and have a chat or work. But I don't see the supreme benefit of looking at a computer screen if you have the opportunity of seeing somebody face to face in real time and real, really sense them in the same room as you. If you're asking, which I think you are asking, does touch create dependency and non-touch evoke autonomy, then I think the Alexander teacher who is evoking too much dependency through hands-on is not teaching, but treating. Those are interesting questions, very interesting questions. But to have an extra sense to use, my sense of touch, for me, couldn't be a, a disadvantage. For me, it can only be an advantage because it's an extra, an extra dimension. However, if I want to work with 100 people or 300 people, then you are not going to touch 300 people. If I had a choice, I'd rather have 300 people in an auditorium and talk about the introductions to the Alexander Technique than 300 people on Zoom. But there are great advantages here right now where we have up to 300 people who wouldn't fly in to my auditorium in London. And so there are advantages in accessing people you wouldn't be able to access if you asked them to fly into London. So I think you're asking important questions about what are you teaching? I believe Alexander is teaching, not treatment. Yes, you give an experience with touch and you give a new experience. But the question is, are pupils learning to effectively take it with them over time? Yeah. Take it with them. You can feel good after a massage. We're not disputing. Many things make you feel good. You can sit in an, in an, in an, in an opera and feel good. We're not talking about whether you feel good. Alexander is teaching you to look after yourself without the teacher, ultimately, or with less of a teacher, ultimately. And so I am very classical in that respect. I want to teach people to look after themselves in a different way, in a way that's healthier, kinder, more poised, more compassionate, more relational, more vibrant, more inclusive of the richness of experience. I want people to have that experience without me being in the room or even in a Zoom room. And whether I teach on Zoom or face-to-face -face in a real room, I want to teach and not treat. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Was there any other one desperately put up their hands, Ina? Otherwise we can say our fond farewells. Um, there are no more hands up. Good, okay, good. Well, thank you. Um, it's been a great experience for me, actually, because being forced into this situation of having to, to share has made me clarify my thinking. That's been a help for me. Without having to put it into words, it remains less concrete, but by sharing in words, Having this opportunity has been a, a benefit to me to think, to clarify, to digest, to reflect, and maybe to refine, and ultimately even to change my thoughts on, on a number of topics. So thank you for being the, the vehicle that's encouraged me to participate in my own ongoing evolution and my own Alexander journey. And wherever you are, feel like a Eurovision Song Contest host now, <laughs> wherever you are. Uh, enjoy yourselves, be safe, be healthy, 
and um, I am very happy to do another session if I find a good time which doesn't clash with too many other exciting online things. And uh, I look forward to sharing with you some more ideas when the time is right. So take care, all of you. Thanks a lot for your patience and presence. It does actually come across this week. Bye for now. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. 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 Bye b